Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Forgotten Film Channel. And today we're talking about Forgotten Film star, author S.S. Van Dyne. S.S. Van Dyne was born on October the 15th, 1888 in Charlottesville, Virginia. His birth name was Willard Huntington Wright. When he was a child, his family moved to Santa Monica, California. As a young man, he attended college at St. Vincent's, Pomona, and Harvard, but he didn't get any degrees from any of them. In 1907, he married Catherine Boynton Bell. They pretty much had no money. He was unable to hold down any kind of odd job, so his parents supported them 100%. In 1909 is when they moved to Los Angeles, and he was able to get a job as the literary editor of the Los Angeles Times. In 1911, they had a daughter. Later that same year, he abandoned his young family, moved to New York City, and was able to get a job as the editor of the Smart Set magazine. He was known to write witty columns, scathing editorials, and published the newest trend, which was realist fiction. In 1913, he traveled to Europe. He went to both Paris and Munich, where he attended an art exhibition that was pioneered in part by his brother, Stanton MacDonald Wright. This was in the newest style, which was abstract synchronism. He returned to the States in December of 1913 and wrote the article, From Expressionism to Synchronism, which introduced America to the new art movement. In 1914, the smart set had to fire him. Their reason was because he was publishing unconventional and sexually explicit materials in their magazine. So he returned to California, became a freelance writer, and was extremely popular with members of the art community. 1917, he published an opinion piece. It was called Misinforming a Nation, and what it was was him criticizing America's support of World War I. His opinion was not popular at all, and it actually caused him to be accused of being a German spy, and he was blackballed by the writing community. So in 1920, he moved back to New York City and started just taking any kind of freelance work he could get, which in some cases he felt was beneath him, and he started drinking and possibly abusing drugs, in addition to that, he was broke, and he had one hell of a bad attitude. It's reported in 1922 that not only was he living off of his friends, borrowing money that he was not able to repay, he also was sponging off of a married woman. And because he was an ass, by the end of that year, all of his friends had written him off. In 1923, he suffered from a complete physical and mental breakdown. And while he was recovering from that breakdown, he became a huge fan of the commercially popular detective novels. By 1926, he had developed his own character. The character's name was Philo Vance. He was a rich society sleuth who solved crimes just for fun. He brought his character outline to his old friend Maxwell Perkins of Scribner Publishing. And he jumped right on it and agreed that he would publish three books in the fall of 1926, his first book, The Benson Murder Case, was published. That was followed by The Canary Murder Case and The Green Murder Case. Now, Willard Wright was a snob, and he was actually embarrassed that he had sunk to the level where he was himself writing commercial fiction. So, at that point is when he developed his pseudonym, which was S.S. Van Dyne, the letters SS standing for steamship, and he claimed that Van Dyne was uh, one of his old family names. There is no proof of that. Uh, these three books were mad crazy popular. He was soon a bestseller, and America needed to know who was this SS Van Dyne. 
Where did he come from? What was his life? What was going on with him? In the summer of 1928, Scribner started running who is, who do you think he could be type articles. And in fall of that same year, his identity was revealed. Uh, he kept writing the Philo Vance books. And with each one being more popular than the next, by 1930, the money started rolling in. And it was about that time that his mind locked up as well. Oh, he married a socialite. She was a portrait artist named Claire DeLille. And they started living the same lifestyle of Philo Vance. They moved to a penthouse apartment on Central Park West, started throwing lavish parties. He became a dog breeder and started hanging out with socialites in the dog show set and developed a hobby of collecting exotic fish. And to be perfectly honest, this lifestyle was not cheap. They were just burning through the box. In 1931, he was approached by executives from Warner Brothers Studios and was contracted to write a series of 12 shorts. His character for those shorts was Dr. Crabtree who was a crime-solving doctor. Uh, that same year, he agreed to allow Warner Brothers to produce a few movies with the character of Philo Vance, which were also mad crazy popular. 1932, he was personally sued by two men who claimed that his short, The Studio Murder Mystery, was actually a word-for-word adaption of a movie that they had written for Paramount years earlier. This case had been settled out of court. By 1934, America was gripped by the depression. It was affecting just about everybody. And to be perfectly honest, nobody wanted to read about or go see any movies that had anything to do with the super rich. So society sleuths like Philo Vance were out and it was time for the error of the hard-boiled dick like Sam Spade. In 1936 was when the very last of the Philo Vance novels was published. And by 1938, he was back to the same old pattern. He was bitter, broke, and a drunk again. His final screenplay was the Gracie Allen murder case that was released in 1939. I've seen the movie, I like it, but it was not very popular at all. On April the 11th, 1939, Willard Stanton Wright was found dead in his Manhattan apartment of a massive heart attack at age 51. He was cremated. As an author, he published a total of 70 short stories and articles under his birth name, Willard Stanton Wright. Under the name of S.S. Van Dyne, he published 36 short stories, novels, and movie screenplays. And what I have for you today on the Forgotten Film Channel are two of those early shorts starring Donald Meeks as Dr. Crabtree. So I just want to thank you for tuning in and make sure that you have a great today and I hope that tomorrow is even better.
Well, Dr. Brett, what do you find? Inspector, both of these men were killed instantly. This one by a bullet fired into his left temple. The other by a shot right into his heart. No other wounds? No. Not a mark of violence on either of the bodies. Well, how about the gun? He was holding it in a tight grip. I didn't want to remove it until you came. Here, I'll get it for you now. No, wait. Don't disturb anything yet. I have an idea old Doc Crabtree will be interested in this case. Gramercy, 50485. Police caller, make a snappy. You mean to tell me you need the help of that old professor again? I don't need anybody's help. But I kind of like the old duck. He's sort of a lucky piece to me. Hello, Doc. Yes. You guessed it. A beautiful murder. Two of them. Yeah. Can you come down to 500 Wall Street right away? Yeah. Western Company, room 304. Oh, Wall Street. Well, there's nothing mysterious about a killing in Wall Street. I know, I made one myself. <laughs> All right, I'll be right over. 32. Two shells exploded. Looks like a simple case of murder and suicide to me. The powder marks are too near in both cases. I'd say it was a double suicide. Do you mind if I make a little guess, too? Maybe the fellow here got up at sunrise, shot himself, and then sat down again. Now, oh, look here, Doc. I asked you to come over here because I thought you might be useful. Come on, let's go down to cases. Wait a minute. I had nothing to do with this. Tell that to the inspector. Well, who are you? I'm Martin Hill, the bookkeeper and accountant here. You mean you were the bookkeeper here? Homer and West are dead. I know all about it. They told me downstairs. What were you doing at that door? I usually come in through Mr. West's private door. I never use the main entrance down the hall. Excuse me, would you mind identifying the bodies? That's Homer, the junior partner. That's Clyde West, all right. Who else is employed in this office? Well, there's Dorothy, that is Miss Page, the secretary. What time is the secretary due at the office? Well, she's late now. That Dorothy is always late. She could come in any time she liked. West was nuts about her. All right, Mr. Hill. We'll talk to you later. Just a moment, Mr. Hill. When you said the boss was, uh, nuts about her, did you mean he cared for her? In a big way, if you get what I mean. And, uh, were you nuts about her, too? But supposing I was, what good would it do me? West had what she liked, money. And them that has, gets. That's all, Mr. Hill. I think we're beginning to get somewhere. A very obvious clue, Doc. You mean very elementary, Watson, don't you? Ah, you give me a stiff pain in the... <laughs> Why isn't that stenographer here yet? I wish I were her boss. Not at this moment, you don't. Oh. Where'd that come from? Oh. Take her over on that couch. Right. Get hold of it, Tom. She's all right. Just a little suffocation and fright. Well, good morning, Miss Page. Late as usual. Oh. Who is she? Our secretary. Bring her over here. So you're Miss Page. Well, maybe you can tell us who killed Homer and West. You were in that closet. And don't tell me you were waiting for a streetcar. Wait, there's no need to be frightened, miss. Just tell us in your own words what happened. Well, all I know is that Clyde, that is, Mr. West, asked me to come to the office last night at 10 o'clock. Said he had a very important business appointment, that he might need me. I arrived sharp at 10. Was there a light in the office when you arrived? Yes, but just as I entered, the light went out. Someone grabbed me, and before I could scream, I was knocked unconscious. And that's the very last thing I remember until just a few moments ago when I opened my eyes on that couch. Uh, have you been reading any murder mysteries lately? Well, that's the truth, I tell you. Inspector, we have established the fact that the murders were committed between 9 and 10 o'clock last night. Now, it seems to me that's a most unusual hour for so many visitors to a Wall Street brokerage office. Why not call the elevator man who brought them up? Okay. Bring in the elevator, man. That's all, Miss Page, for the moment. 
What's your name? Andy Amos Lindbury. Is that your real name? Yes, sir. I was named Abraham Washington, but I done baptized myself for something more famous. What's your job here? I was the elevator man, and I don't know nothing. You don't, eh? Well, you refresh your memory a little about last night. Who did you bring up on the elevator to this floor about 10 o'clock? Yes, sir. Let me see. About 9.30, I brought up Mr. West. And about 10 o'clock, I brought up Mr. Homer. Maybe you'd better take a look at the bodies just to make sure. Excuse me. I ain't in no mood to look at no departed soul. So Wait a minute. Control yourself. Come back here and answer my questions. Yes, sir. Did you bring anyone else up? Let me see. Uh, yes, sir. There's Miss Page, Mr. West's secretary. How did you know she was his secretary? Well, they always had a lot of night work together. And then there's another man who goes up here about 10.30. I see him around here plenty, but I don't know what they call him. What did he look like? I can't remember, Your Honor. Did you take any of these people down with you? No, sir. But they could have walked down when I was in the basement. Where were you at 10.30? How do you expect me to remember where I was for back as last night? You didn't do it, did you? Most emphatically, no, sir. Sit down there. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. This man wants to see Clive West immediately. He looks kind of excited. Colonel Frederick Pettijohn. Send him in. Yes. Know him, Doc? I do know. How about you, Doctor? Never heard of him. There he is. That's the man who comes in here at 10.30 last night. Better, John? What were you doing here in this office at 10.30 last night? Have a chair. Look here, I'm Colonel Pettigrew. Have two chairs. What's this nonsense about me being here last night? I wasn't anywhere near this office. Oh, no, Colonel. That story won't do. Here is a notation that Mr. West had an appointment at 10.15 last night with F.P., and now, of course, F.P. might mean Fairy Prince, and then again, it might mean Frederick Pettijohn. But just go ahead and tell us what you know about this. Well, what if I was here last night? I didn't get inside the office. I was a little late and arriving for my appointment. When I rapped at the door and got no answer, I took it for granted that West didn't wait for the appointment. So I went home. What was your business with Mr. West? Purely private. Wouldn't interest you. Oh, it wouldn't interest me, eh? Now get this, Colonel. This is a murder investigation, not a social team. And I'm not taking alibis as a substitute for information. Is that clear? Pardon me, uh, Inspector. Maybe the Colonel would like a more direct question. You bought a great deal of stock here at on margin, didn't you? I did. Mm -hmm. What about it? And one particular stock collapsed the day before... Well, I don't know what stock you mean. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's call it uh, garbage can preferred. But the fact remains that you owed West and Company a large sum of money. And if you had killed Homer and West and removed the records of your business transactions from their files, you could have saved yourself from bankruptcy. Or worse, couldn't you, Colonel? Okay. Yes, I could have. But I didn't. You've got nothing on me. Oh, uh, Mr. Pettijohn, are you an army colonel or are you from Kentucky? Engineering Corps. Retired. Then I take it you are versed in the uh, use of firearms. Do you own a gun? I do. Several. Have you ever seen this revolver? Well, why, why, yes, I have seen that gun before. Yes, Colonel? That gun belongs to Mrs. Par... Yes, Colonel, you were going to say this gun belongs to Mrs. Parnell. Mrs. Reginald Parnell, weren't you? How the deuce do you know that? Oh, I've gotten into the bad habit of talking with office boys, porters, and bookkeepers. Am I right, Colonel? Yes, I am. I'm afraid so. You see, Mrs. Parnell, West, Homer, and myself were partners in a rather large pool. I hate to see it of a dead man, but it looked like Homer was a crook. He handled the pool. He manipulated our money and wiped us out. I was on my way up here last night to demand an accounting. There was no answer at the door, so I left. If you don't mind, uh, Inspector, I think I'll pay a little uh, visit to Mrs. Parnell. By the way, where does Mrs. Parnell live, Colonel? At my hotel, the Ambassador. Thank you. And I'll just take this gun along. If you have no objections, Inspector? Well, not yet, I haven't. But what are you up to? Up to my neck in clues. I'll be back shortly. Do you realize, Mrs. Parnell, that it was your gun that killed these two men? I'm not a bit sorry. They took me for every cent my ex-husband settled on me. Now I've lost everything except my vote. 
and you can have that. <laughs> but then I can't expect your type to understand Wall Street. Oh, yes, I do. I know the thrill. I once dropped a nickel in a phone box and got back 20 dimes. Isn't that Wall Street? Well, I haven't gotten back a red cent. And so you threatened Edwin Homer when he came here yesterday. That's a lie. I admit Homer was here last night. I told him I wanted my money. He gave me a lot of alibis. He saw the gun lying on my table. Thought I was threatening to shoot him and made a grab for it. Said it would be safer with him. Any idea where he went? Well, he said he was going down to the office and get his partner West to do something about raising that money. That's all I know. Now, please go. I'm a nervous woman. Pardon me. Uh, do you mind spraying a little of that this way? Thank you. Uh, do you mind telling me where you were at 10 o'clock last night? At 10? Yes. Why, I, uh, uh, I went to bed. Any witnesses? Yeah. My Pekingese. Oh, Thank you. And now, if we need your testimony, <clears throat> we'll send for you. For both of you. Good day. Colonel Pettyjohn for murdering Homer and West. Not really. Oh, tut, 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 tut. We proved he had an appointment here last night. He identified the revolver, and they had the best motive in the world. Why, <laughs> it's ridiculous. You might as well pin it on Lindy. He's here all night with nothing to do. By the way, how do you pass the time at night, Lindy? Boss, I just sit back in my chair and let the time pass me. Now look here, Doc. It's a clear case against the Colonel. If you found out anything else, let's have it. I have found out something else. I have found out who committed the murders. Oh, yeah? What are you trying to do? Keep it a secret? No, it's an open book. Edwin Homer killed Clive West. Very interesting. But that doesn't prove who killed Edwin Homer. The problem is very simple, Inspector. Somebody on the inside of this office must have committed both murders, for the door was locked from the inside. Is that right? Yes, but how about this fire escape here? I have just verified the fact that the murderer did not go down the fire escape, as there are no footprints on the soft lawn beneath this window. Now, he certainly must have made some imprint jumping 12 feet. But what about the ownership of the gun? This Mrs. Parnell. Homer got that gun from her last night, along with some perfume for his handkerchief. Listen. Homer came here last night to plead with his partner to straighten him out on that crooked deal. West refused. And rather than face the music, Homer took out Mrs. Parnell's revolver and shot him in the left temple. Yes, but the gun was found in West's hand. So it was. And this was found in Homer's hand. Now let us turn back the clock ten hours. Maybe we can reconstruct the events of last night. After shooting West, Homer, his junior partner, started to search the files. I guess he had hopes of destroying the records of that crooked deal. He was also after securities and cash with which to pay Mrs. Parnell after she had threatened to have him arrested. Suddenly, he heard someone coming down the hall. He turned off the light. It was Miss Page, the stenographer. She entered. He grabbed her exactly as she told us. And after knocking her unconscious, he carried her to the clothes closet and locked her in. The office door was open. He closed and locked it. Then came a knock. This time, it was Colonel Pettijohn. Homer saw the shadow of the Colonel at the door, but didn't budge. The colonel, believing that West had not waited for him, went away. Homer then decided to put the gun in the dead man's hand so that the crime would appear as suicide. 
He was a cautious man, this Homer. Leaning over the desk, he maneuvered West's strifeless finger around the trigger. A hair trigger. It pressed too hard. And the bullet was thus fired by the dead man through the handkerchief into Homer's heart. There you are. Grim justice, I call it. A great yarn for tomorrow's papers, I call it. I always say, if a man bites a dog, that's news. And if a dog bites a detective, that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Inspector. Well, Doc, here's something off the beaten track. A murder, and nothing left but the bone. But how are we going to determine how long it's been here? I don't know. There don't seem to be any clues. Maybe the medical examiner has some idea about it. My guess is this man was murdered over a year ago. It looks as though he'd been there for years and years. I don't think so. He was killed with a blunt instrument. I should discover in three places. Hey, wh what's going on here? You live around here? I'm from the police department. Uh, yes, I, uh, I own this property. Yeah, well, somebody's been using your back alley as a cemetery. Cemetery? Yes. Uh, do you recall anyone digging or excavating here within the past year or so, Mr. Uh, uh, Beck? Uh, my name is uh, Beck. Beck. Yes, I, yes, I, I remember. My grandson complained some time ago about the gas being cut off. They, they were digging out here then. When was that? I, 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 I just can't remember. Well, where's your grandson now? I want to talk to him. Oh, no. No, you can't talk to him. He's... What was that? Well, uh, you can't disturb him. He doesn't want to be disturbed. Is that so? Well, we've got to get some action. Come on, let's go. Paul, why aren't you more careful? More careful? Now, ah, that's right in my face, in my hair, and, oh, everything's going wrong. Oh, just a minute. That stuff went all over me. Paul, it's your own fault. My fault? I told you not to use so much acid. You told me. Why don't you do it yourself? Always blaming me. Now, Paul, don't excite yourself, dear. It's all right. Anything wrong, Paul? No. That fool sister of mine, always making mistakes. What do they want? Well, uh, these gentlemen want to talk to you, Paul, from the police department. Police? Please, please don't disturb him now. I'm very sorry, miss. Paul, Mr. General. You see, my grandson is trying to finish a very important experiment. I see you are studying biological uh, chemistry. 
study. My brother uh, has advanced far beyond any of the authorities. Now, mm. Amy, Amy, come, come. Now, Paul, can't you talk to these gentlemen just a moment? Just a moment. Your grandfather tells us that some time ago your gas was turned off while the main was being repaired. You remember that? Do I remember it? I'll never forget it. I've lost a whole week's work on account of it. Had to do everything all over again. Oh, oh. They gave us absolutely no notice. That was too bad. Uh, do you recall when that happened? I can tell you the very day. The very hour it happened. Mm. That was experiment K-11. K-11. Everything ruined. Gas off 10.45 a.m. That was April 14th, 1930. Well, were the workmen of the gas company digging in the alley that day? Yes. Why don't you go to the gas company for your information instead of bothering us? Oh, now get this. The remains of a man's body were found in the alley back of your house. We're investigating it. And we expect the cooperation of every one of you. We don't bother anybody. We wouldn't know about such things. Inspector, couldn't we talk to these people later on if it's necessary? All right. That's all for now. Come on, let's go. Uh, you see, my grandson is nervous. Very nervous. Ah, but you'll hear great things about that boy. Someday his name will be famous in the world of science. Well, quite a collection of Chinese antiques you have here. Oh, yes, I might almost call myself an authority on Oriental art. And some of these things are very rare. Indeed. Here's a cute little toy, Doc. <laughs> yes, just one tap, and that would be the finish. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Jeff. Oh, I'm very proud of those. I got them from a friend a few months ago. You see, centuries ago, among the ancient Manchus... Let's skip that part. Who did you get them from? I was just coming to that. Uh, my friend downstairs is the Honorable Wang Yong. A Chinese gentleman who imports antiques for American collectors. And these things are all gifts from him. Downstairs, eh? Yes. Thanks. We may see you again. Soon. I see Mr. Wang Young. Oh, oh just a moment. Uh, just a moment, please. The police? It's the police? All right, Kong. I'll see them. Come in, please. Good evening, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Well, I don't know yet. We've just come from your friends upstairs. Oh, yes, the Banks. Remarkable people. Oh, the old Mr. Bank. Fine Oriental scholar. Young people, very nervous. Will the gentleman be seated? No, thank you, not now. Here's another cute little toy. Uh, Mr. Wang. Where were you during the month of April, 1930? Do you remember? Chinese have good memories. I left here for San Francisco on the 10th of April. How long were you there? I'll return on the 15th of May. Were you in San Francisco on business? Yes, I have a warehouse there. Well, uh, then, of course, you'd know nothing about the bones of a man found buried in a trunk in your alley here. Too bad. Sorry. I can't be of an assistant to police. Well, perhaps we'll be back. Soon, I hope. Perhaps sooner than that. Good day. I'll tell you, Inspector, we simply can't identify the remains of that man. We don't know what he looked like. We don't know who he was. You see, Doc, they've searched every missing person's file in the country for a man with a skull that size and age. Might as well try identifying the bones of a prehistoric animal. Inspector, I'm going to ask you a most unusual favor. 
I want you to make me the custodian of that skull. What do you think, Lieutenant? Well, since you're asking me, Chief, I'd say the case was washed up. You haven't got the body, you've got no suspects. You forget the occupants of that house. <laughs> A Chinaman. And three intellectual nuts. Now, you found out that the Becks told the truth about the gas company digging in the alley. You might just as well say that some of the workmen did the, uh, bury the trunk. Someone might have buried it shortly after the workmen got through. The earth was easy to dig into, and the loose soil wouldn't have aroused any suspicion. You're wasting your time, Doc. Well, all right, Doc. We'll let you have your way. But remember, dead men's bones tell no oh, tales. Thank you, Inspector. Thank you. Phallic index, 75. 75, yes. Uh, have you got them all, Dr. Patrick? I think so. Uh, let me see. Nose, leptophene with an index of 48. Facial index, 85 degrees. Intrapupillary width, 67. Mm-hmm. Oh, just a minute, Dr. Crabtree. This man was not white. You knew that, of course. I know, I did not. This is the head of an oriental. Not a Chinese. It's Mongolian, at least Asiatic. <clears throat> Professor, you say there are no two skulls exactly alike? Just as with fingerprints, no two alike. Why can't you apply the anthropologist's method to this case? You reconstruct the bodies of prehistoric animals from skeletons, as for instance. Now, why can't you recreate this skull into something resembling its former likeness? Hmm? I think we can. Death robs man of the flesh, but bones remain to guide us. You <laughs> see, Dr. Daisy yeah. Well, I must be going. Come back in a day or so, Doctor, and I'll show you an Oriental that will amaze you. And I'm going to show Inspector Carr an Oriental that will amaze him. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> Good day, Dr. Francis. Another trip to San Francisco, Mr. Wang? No, sir. China, on business. Yeah. Well, there's more important business going to detain you here, get me? Now, we've just learned that you arrived in San Francisco on the 28th of April. You told us you left here on the 10th of April. Where were you between those dates, Mr. Wang? Visiting my branch stores. Inspector, it seems rather strange to me that Mr. Wang, with such an extensive business, would go away and leave this place unattended. I have a young friend, Charlie Lee, who stayed here most of the time. Well, where is he now, this Lee? Back in Cambridge, finishing college. Anyone around here know him? Oh, yes. He was quite friendly of the family upstairs, the bank. Well, uh, was that about the time of the murder? I have already told you, after time of the murder, I was in San Francisco, on business. Well, better postpone that trip to China. Get me, Mr. Wang? And I don't mind telling you I'm having this place watched. Come along, Doc. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, can I do something for you? I think you can. At least, I hope so. Look at this. Ooh. An unusually fine piece of work. And I shall expect as good from you, but... It calls for the utmost secrecy. Uh -huh. For you, Lieutenant. Hmm, here's our answer from Cambridge. The university says, Charlie Lee didn't come back to finish his term last year. Present whereabouts unknown. Well, it's a Chinese puzzle, all right. But we've got to solve it. Come on, let's go. Paul will be here in a minute. 
Mr. Wang here claims that when he went to San Francisco, he left things in charge of Charlie Lee, a young Chinese student who is now in Cambridge. Do you know this Charlie Lee? Oh, oh yes, I know him. He used to visit Mr. Wang. I, I used to see him quite often. He is quite interested in our work. <laughs> When did you last see Charlie Lee? I don't know. I think he left here just before Mr. Wang went to San Francisco. No, 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 Mr. Paul. No, that is wrong. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly. Oh, but Mr. Paul. I think Mr. Lee was here after Mr. Wang left. Yes, I think it was shortly after. I, uh, but I don't just remember. I left a long time before Charlie Lee. Did you? Uh, well, uh, maybe you're right. It was such a long time ago. Well, then, I have nothing else to say. Now, listen. You're lying to me, every one of you. And I want the truth or... Oh, that's Congo. He's got loose. Here, she, Congo. As you see, it's one of our pets. Uh, my grandson is greatly interested in zoology. Okay, Inspector. Dr. Crabtree is ready for you downstairs. All right. Come on, Mr. Wang, you come with me. Come in, Mr. Wang. There's someone here to see you. Oh, hello, Charlie. I got your letter a few days ago. Where is that letter? It's over there. Let's see it. Come on, show it to me. Well, show it to me. I just got this letter a few days ago. Yeah? Sure, I did. Let's see the envelope. Mm. Mail from Cambridge, all right. The address was removed with ink eradicator. No. Ink eradicator. Holy mackerel, the Vex. Uh. What's the matter with him tonight? Better give him something to keep him quiet. Charlie Lee did not give his life for science. They took it. Grandpa, where's Paul? We've got to do something quick. The police know. Oh, shut up. Hey, hit me. What's that? Uh, they caught him trying to throw that out of the broken window. Oh, shut up. Oh, just a few more days and we could finish everything. Can't we get away? No, it wouldn't be easy. The police are guarding both the front and the back of the house. Oh, just a few more days. Just a few more days and they'd know we have the right to kill him. Oh, no. We couldn't get away. It's impossible. Well, then... We'd all be better off to be dead than to stop now. We can get out the back way. about this. They must have another man upstairs. Doc, you go up the front way of the lieutenant. Ready? Come with me. Come on, Come on. Come on. Come on.
anybody there, Lieutenant. Oh, nobody there. Strange? Sure is. They must be here. Uh-uh. Oh. Oh. They might be up here, Doc. I'll take a look. Oh. 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 What the? Ah. What is it, Lieutenant? Ah. You ought to see what's up here. Oh. with that TNT, you're under arrest. If I pour this into here, you'll all be blown to pieces. Now, drop those guns, and I'll tell you something about my experiments. Come on, drop them. I'll give you three counts to do it. One, two, yeah. Now, you'll all die. Just like Charlie Lee did. Yes. I killed him, but you're... The Skull Mystery. That'll make a great headline. Say, what are they going to do with the Beck family? Send them to the chair? No, they'll send them to the asylum. Yeah, another case like this and we'll all go to the asylum. Say, Inspector. I just got word from headquarters. They found a skull in a suitcase over on Central Avenue. Another one.